Namaste. So in part one of Adhikarana 4, we went over a lengthy, highly technical objection or challenge by an opponent to the philosophy of Shankara and Vyasadev that the Upanishads reveal Brahman. Now, what are they trying to do? Well, first of all, let's look at who they are. Who are the opponents, both individually and collectively? They are people who have not realized Brahman. <laughs> so, what they try to do is to bring Brahman within the realm of the known. And the way they do that is by claiming that the Upanishadic revelation of Brahman is simply a philosophical, logical conclusion, an inference based on making metaphors out of other things that resemble it. For example, light, uh, for example, power or creativity or intelligence or consciousness. So they have to do this. You know, th this is the compassion part, right? <laughs> they have to do it to justify their existence, their state of being. Like, I often wondered, you know, during the time when I was being persecuted by some uh, members of a religious group, or actually several religious groups, I often wonder, why do they do this, you know? And the more I thought about it, the more it seemed clear that they have to. They have to. Just like the Jews had to have Jesus crucified. See, just like my enemies have to spread black propaganda about me. In the same way, the opponents of someone as highly intelligent and realized as Shankaracharya have to argue with him to justify their own states of being and their lack of realization. Oh, it's just an inference. Based on their degree of education, their intellectual ability and so on, Either those attempts will be sort of clumsy and ham-handed and obviously invalid, or they may be quite sophisticated, like, for example, in the present case. But when we see how the sutra replies and how Shankaracharya deals with it, we'll see that they, they simply like shrug it off because they know you haven't realized Brahman talking to the opponent. So how can you say anything about it? You don't know. So shut up already. <laughs> Yet this discussion will turn into a grand, long diatribe and uh, interaction, a debate, really, about this topic. Because if you have any experience in Eastern philosophy, Vedantic philosophy, and so on, try to tell your parents, try to tell your family, try to tell your friends at work about it. Huh? You only try it if a couple of times <laughs> before you realize, oops, this isn't going to work. Why? They haven't realized Brahman. Even though they are Brahman, and they're absolutely dependent on Brahman for their everything, including their existence, they can't recognize it because they have to justify their ignorance. So the Advaitin does not take offense, but simply brushes it off and replies calmly. And we'll see how the sutra just 
invalidates the entire objection, the entire challenge of the opponents with one little syllable. This contingency having arisen, the answer is being given. Tat tu saman vayat. Tu but. Tat that Brahman. Saman vayat. Being the object of full import. But that Brahman is known from the Upanishads, it being the object of their fullest import. The word to, but, is meant to rule out the opponent's point of view. Tut, that, means Brahman, which is omniscient and omnipotent, which is the cause of the origin, existence, and dissolution of the universe, and which is known as such from the Upanishads alone. How? Samanvayat, because of being the object of their fullest import. For in all the Upanishads, the texts become fully reconciled when they are accepted as establishing this very fact as their fullest import. So, to, but, that's all the opponent deserves. <laughs> but, never mind. Throwing out refusing to recognize the validity of the challenge of the opponent, even though it's so well-reasoned, and we'll see in the ensuing discussion how intelligent actually the opponent is. There's only one problem. They don't know Brahman because they haven't accepted the authority of the Upanishads. Brahman cannot be known because it is never the object of anything, including a process of knowledge. Any instrument of knowledge, such as reason, inference, even direct perception, cannot touch Brahman. Brahman is fully transcendental. So the only way, the only possible way to know Brahman is if Brahman reveals itself. And it does so in the Upanishads. As for instance, O amiable one, this universe before its creation was but existence, one without a second. Chandogya Upanishad 621. Before creation, this universe was but the self that is one. Aitre Upanishad. One, one, one. That Brahman is without prior or posterior, without interior or exterior, that is, homogeneous and without a second. This self, the perceiver of everything, is Brahman. Brihararanyakopanishad 2, 5, 19. All that is in front is Brahman, the immortal, Mundakopanishad 2, 2, 11, etc. Besides, when the words in the Upanishadic sentences become fully ascertained as but revealing the nature of Brahman, it is not proper to fancy some other meaning, for that will result in rejecting something established by the Vedas and accepting some other thing not intended by them. And it cannot be held that those words have for their ultimate purpose only a delineation of the nature of the agent, that is, the performer of the rites. For there are such Vedic texts as, But when to the knower of Brahman everything has become the self, then what should one see and through what? Brihararanyakopanishad 2. 414, which deny action, instrument, and result. Okay, okay, we got to slow down a little. <laughs> it's getting deep. Well, anytime he quotes the Upanishads, you can bet that if you go back and look up that quote and dig into the context, you will find something wonderful. 
This is my experience. Every single time I go back and look at one of these quotes, I strike gold. Let's take just one, the last one from Brihadaranak. Because when there is duality, as it were, then one smells something, one sees something, one hears something, one speaks something, one thinks something, one knows something. But when to the knower of Brahman everything has become the self, then what should one smell and through what? What should one see and through what? What should one hear and through what? What should one speak and through what? What should one think and through what? What should one know and through what? Through what should one know that owing to which all this is known? Through what, O oh Maitreyi, should one know the knower? This is Brahman. We've said several times, Brahman has no relation with anything else. Well, what does that actually mean? That when we are in full awareness, full realization of Brahman, we do not know, we do not see, we do not understand, we are not conscious of anything. How is it possible? because there is no other thing to be conscious of. Brahman is one. Brahman is all. There is nothing besides Brahman, one without a second. So Brahman can't be conscious because consciousness requires an object. And there is no object in Brahman Plus, Brahman itself never becomes an object. So, Brahman simply knows itself in the same way as you and I know that we are conscious. What is that? Awareness of awareness. Consciousness of consciousness. Turiya. And this is also the means by which we are conscious of our dualistic consciousness. Consciousness of the mind, the senses, the body, the sense objects, and so on. Actions and their results. Qualities and their opposites. Everything that is existing. We can't really say that Brahman exists because it's imperceptible. It can't be experienced except by being it. And that's easy because we are already Brahman. <laughs> we just have to recognize and confirm it to ourselves in our own experience. And this is the realization that leads to the end of suffering. Aum Tat Sat, Aum Shakti Aum, Aum Namah Shivaya.